Jessica Smith. I'm representing TASU, and I will be introducing Julia Jefferson. Julia Jefferson, a former educator, now a businesswoman, has always knew she was related to Thomas Jefferson, but not until recently did she know how closely related she was to one of our founding fathers. Julia Jefferson, great-grandfather Eston Jefferson, was Thomas Jefferson's son. His mother was Sally Hemings, one of Thomas Jefferson's slaves. Rumors of the President's Affair with Sally Hemings has, all, has been in print since 1802, when a journalist by the name of James Callender stated that the President has several children by Sally Hemings. The President never had any comments about these statements. <coughs> Most of Jefferson's descendants and many historians have dismissed the idea of Jefferson's children with Sally Hemings. Until these, until these recent DNA tests that show rare genetic traces in Jefferson's family and the Hemings' descendants. There is no proof that Hemings and Jefferson shared love, but their affair did last over 38 years. After Jefferson's death, Hemings' children were either set free or allowed to escape. Julie Jefferson's ancestor, Eston, settled in Wisconsin. With the new genetic findings, Jefferson hopes to be buried in the Jefferson's family cemetery. Julia Jefferson proudly says, I am Scottish, Irish, English, French, Welsh, and African. <coughs> I am proud to present Ms. Julie Jefferson. such a distinguished guest to you all. Miss Banks Young is a poet, an author, and a playwright. She has produced Generational Harmony, a public affairs television program. She is a native of Columbus, Ohio, and also has done consulting, uh, <coughs> finding, and charting genealogy charts for other families. As I introduce to some and present to others. I'd like you all to take a part of her energy because she is a very energetic person, Miss Shay Banks Young. Allow us to take you on a trip, walk your thoughts to a tomorrow, and then ride them to a memory. Come into our world of love, peace, and yes, sometimes pain. We promise to return you safely back to your world again. I'm going to ask your cooperation with something special we want to do with you this morning before we get into an actual dialogue. I need your participation in something. Would you do that for me? A few people said sure. <laughs> Two people over here. Would you do that for me? Yes. All right, okay. Now, you're sitting nice and close, so this is good. Uh, put our first uh, chart up that you have there for me. There's a family chart. I want you to put that up for me. And we have a family chart that we'll be working from for a while, but for the moment, I don't even want you to look at it. I just want to have it up there so later you're going to make reference to it. One of the oldest relatives that we are aware of is an African woman that uh, the grandfather that I came through, Madison Hemings, Julia comes through Esther Hemings. Madison, in his memoirs, talked about his great-grandmother, who was a pure-blooded African woman. Somewhere along the line, some historian has given her a name, and we're not sure exactly if it's real, but we use it anyway, Baya Baya. And I would like for you to become my first, our first relative that we know from the continent of Africa. Will you do that for me? Now, to do it, you must Close your eyes. Julia's watching you and I'm watching you so we see you. <laughs> and I want you to relax in your seat and you're going to, I want to take you on a visual journey. As we begin, I don't want you looking at the chart or at me, close your eyes and let us take you on this journey. Your name is Baya Thea. You are from the west coast of Africa. You are a young person, young teenager. 
and you're having a wonderful life. You know who you are, you know your family, you know your history and your heritage. You live among everyone that you've always known, your brothers and sisters and mother and grandparents. You live in a community that is, that is very strong and each person has their own duty and responsibility and you even have yours. You have been taught for generations about the pride and heritage of your, of your country that you live in, the tribe that you come from, the culture in which you embrace. And you're a young person living a very normal life of a young person of your time. And on this particular day, as you wake up and you're moving around your village and your community and speaking with everyone and talking with everyone, you remember having heard rumors over the last weeks and months of some things that have been happening in your country. But as a young person, you know, we don't always keep that foremost in our mind, but there's been some things happening of a few people disappearing from time to time, and you've been warned to kind of be careful, but you're young and you don't really think that this could happen to me, and you, you have a wonderful day and you're doing great things, and you talk to your grandmother for a while, and you kind of leave your community for a while outside your village and you come back in only to hear loud noises and people screaming and you're wondering what's going on, what's happening and, and you hear people screaming loud and noises happening and be, they're running and, and you're wondering what's going on and before you know it someone has hit you and they, they've caused you to fall down and you don't know what's happening. You're now blacked out and when you wake up later, you find blood all over your head and your body and you're trying to figure out what's going on and someone has tied your hands and they're getting you up and they're telling you you've got to walk and you're now broke to someone else who's in front of you around your neck and you're beginning to walk through the, the jungle and through the villages and you see fires burning and people are crying and there are men and women and now you're just walking and you're wondering why are these people doing this to me and where are they taking me? You don't see your mother or your father or any of your brothers and sisters so somehow you're the only one of your family who's been taken with others from your village but from your family this is it. And you finally walk for days and nights and more days it turns into weeks and before you know it you end up in one of the very large rivers that you are familiar with and when you get there some of the old trees that have hollowed out and dead are falling down you see people putting these trees together and wrapping them with limbs from smaller trees and they make rafts that when put together someone can actually get on it and float out into the river you see people going on these big rafts and they're floating out to a distance and you don't know where they're going. And once they disappear, you say, where are they taking these people? Finally, they take you on one and you go all the way out for a long time until finally this river meets the ocean. And when you get out to the ocean, you see this great, big, huge object in the water with big cloth flapping in the wind. And you say, oh, what is this thing? And when you look up, there's these strange looking people standing on this object and you find out later they call it a ship. And these people don't look like anyone you've ever seen before. Their color is strange, their hair is strange, they talk different, and they take you aboard this great big object and they untie you, but now they put you below in the lower level and they chain you to another person. And not only do they chain you now, they're putting you in small areas and you have to crawl in and you are chained to another person in spoon style fashion. Your foot is at their head and their head is at your foot. One person after the other, side by side by side, flat to each other. And above you there are people and below you there are people. And you hear people crying and screaming and you can, you vomit is coming on you now and blood is on you and feces and urine and all types of body fluids. And you're absolutely sick to your stomach and you're screaming, mom, help me, someone get me out of here. And finally, you, you pass out only to look around when you wake up. It's not a nightmare, it's real. After a while, you feel this, this big ship moving and it's beginning to move and you wonder what's going to happen with it. 
And you realize that one woman who now has a baby that's with her, they come down and they take the baby from her and she's screaming and you see that you hear water splashing and you know they've thrown the baby overboard. And the mother is trying to get to the child but she's strapped down. Finally, after days and days, they take you upstairs and you're up at the top and you say, when I get there, I'll jump off and I'll go home. And I know my family will get me, but once you get to the top, there's no more land. You don't see anything but water. And when you get up there, they begin to beat someone in front of you and they take salt and put in his wounds and he screams and yells and they want you to know if you do something, we'll do the same to you. They begin to whip people and they cut people and they let you know that if you do anything, we'll hurt you. But they don't want to kill anybody. They just want to fight you. And you end up being there for weeks. And many of the people that's with you, they die. But as soon as they die, the ship keeps stopping at one port after another, and more people are gathered on to the point that after weeks that you've been on there, there's to the point that you can no longer lay down. Now you're squunched up with your knees up in front of your chest, your hands tied around, and you're in a sitting position. And you stay that way for a long time. You don't even know how long till finally the ship stops. And you don't know if you've been there for a month, five weeks, six weeks. It's just been a long time. Your body is stiff. You're sore. You're weak. It's bleeding. Everything. And you're a child. You don't know where you are. And they take you off. You can't walk anymore. Your limbs are no longer functioning. It takes a long time before you can even get yourself to the point that you can stand on your feet. When they get you into an area, they begin to spray you down with water, clean you up, that's what they say, you know they're doing, and rub oil into your body. And they're shining you up and putting you before other people. And you hear them yelling out noises, and these strange people are beginning to yell out as you see others put on this small little stand like a, like a, like a piece of wood. And they yell out loud numbers and, and saying things, and they're yelling out, and people are coming up to these individuals, putting their hands in their mouth, putting their hands up in their groin, touching them all over their body, pulling their hair, <coughs> looking all over them as though they were a cow or an animal. And you say, what are they doing? And finally, you're put up there. And someone comes up to you and they begin to feel you all over your body. You are naked. You have no clothes on. You are stripped down. And all of these people are treating you as though you were an animal, a vicious animal. They, t they don't want you to talk. They don't want you to say anything, not to move, just be still. Behave. You are no longer a human being. You are no longer even a person. You are now a slave in America. You can no longer speak your language. All of your heritage you've had before is gone. You cannot even practice the way you spoke, the way you cooked, the way you dressed, the way you practiced worshiping. Your God is gone. Everything that you've ever known has been erased. You are something that is considered without a soul. You are a slave. <coughs> In America, you are a buyer they are. And you have just been sold. You have just been sold. Sold to John Wales. Open your eyes. How do you feel? You're a slave. Well, it's hard for me to carry on after hearing that. Every time it, it seems worse to me, because I can visualize it, and I know you can too. Baya Baya was our, I don't know how many greats, grandmothers. And she was bought by a man named John Wales. I will continue with the story as much as I know of it. We don't know exactly what happened to her, but we know what happened to shit slaves that got sold. They either got chained together and walked to the plantation many miles away, or they got thrown onto what they call a wagon and chained to that and drawn to the plantation. Well, she probably went that way, in the wagon or whatever. She arrived, and what faced her was a lot of people that were dark-skinned, but she didn't know any of them. She didn't know any of their language. And you can imagine a young girl, and she must have been fairly young, 
uh, with no mother, no, no tradition, nothing in this cabin. They slept in cabins, maybe 12 people at a time, in a, a space no bigger than 14 by 20. And then the following morning, the horn blows, and they have to get up before dawn. She's dragged out to the field and put to work. Hard work under a boiling sun. Got to pick cotton, perhaps. And did you know when you pick cotton that the cotton ball is full of thorns and your hands bleed by the end of the day? And you're made to fill a year quota or else you get whipped. And if you stop, you get whipped. And if you talk, you get whipped. A lot of the people that she worked with had big scars on their back. And she got some herself, I'm sure, because they whipped everybody. It was not a kind system. At any rate, um, one night, John Wales had a guest named Captain John Hemmings. They had a nice feast, nice dinner. Then afterwards, for a nice little dessert treat, he took John Hem Hemmings out to the slave quarters and said, pick whoever you want for your bed partner. You can have her for the evening as my treat. This was common practice. And uh, he looked around and he chose Baya Baya. And she must have been beautiful, young, or whatever. For whatever reason he chose her, they did mate. And from that mating, he, after that happened, he left and got back on his ship and didn't return for a year. When he came back, there was Baya Bea <coughs> with a baby, considerably lighter skin than she was. And he asked John Wales, is that my child? Or has she been with somebody else? And John Wales said, no, that's your child. And uh, he said, well, I want to buy them <coughs> both. I want to take them back to England because I don't know how this child will turn out. He was very curious, not because he loved by a bea, but because he had never, never seen a child of this nation, which was early in the process. But John Wales was a curious man also, and he, he decided that he, w he wanted to keep her. Then there was a rumor that was passed to John Wales that Captain Hemmings was going to steal this woman and the baby. So John took by a bea and a child who was named Betty, Betty Hemmings, Elizabeth Hemmings, into the house. And that probably changed the fate of our whole family. Because indeed, although house servants worked longer, 24-7, from sunup to sundown, and if anybody woke up during the night and they'd have to fan their, their masters and all, all the things, they didn't work as hard, sweating labor, being beaten and so forth. They were beaten in their own way. I mean, they were whipped if they weren't kept in order. But it changed their opportunities entirely. We also got a name. Yes, and she had her last name. That's where we got our name, Hemmings, from. Um, John Wales had married three times. Uh, his first wife had a, a daughter named Martha, and Martha later married an up-and-coming young politician named Thomas Jefferson. After that, he married, she died, and he married two more times. After the third wife died, by then, little Betty was a grown woman with six children of her own by another slave. Uh, we don't know how long Baya Bay lived or if she was around at that time, but any, at any rate, John Hemmings took her as his concubine and made her have six or children by him. By him. Well, anyway, <laughs> six more children, because slaves were consider considered to be breeding animals. The more slaves that one could produce, babies, of course, that made the men wealthier. At any rate, um, they lived together until John Wales died. Now his oldest daughter, Martha, inherited, after he died, 135 slaves, the property, and about $100,000 in debt, which he took to Thomas Jefferson. So that's the way the Hemmings arrived. Now the youngest child of Betty is named Sally Hemmings. And of course, we hear more about her later. They all came to Monticello and became house servants. Shay, do you want to continue? Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> Sally Hemmings, back and forth. Uh, the, the children that came from uh, Betty Hemmings, they were, and all the Hemmings family came in as kind of uh, special servants because they were, after all, half brothers and sisters to uh, Martha Wells. Uh, you know, they all had the same father. 
And also remember, Betty was probably almost like a mother to her because Martha Wells also didn't, her mother was dead by then, so you have your, your, your mammies around there. So the, the Hemings were always prominent within the plantation. Um, as it turned out, Thomas Jefferson, you don't get the good story about Thomas Jefferson with his wife, and uh, Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson uh, and Martha were married for quite a few years. Ten she, years. And mm -hmm. she, had, she had several children by him, but she was also a very weak woman, and her body did not hold up well. And Martha was one who lost she, some of the children she miscarried, and she had three children that actually lived through everything. But however, on her last uh, child that she had, she became very sick after that, and Martha actually died after giving birth to her last child. But before she died, she had her husband give a deathbed promise that he would never marry because she didn't want any children to come into the home of her with her children. And Thomas Jefferson evidently gave that promise to his wife. Uh, when Martha died, young Sally evidently was by her side, as well as Betty Hemings and some of the others. And Thomas Jefferson was very distraught for a long time, and he really grieved over her. After a while, Thomas Jefferson uh, was offered a position of uh, ambassador to France, which uh, Ben Franklin had held before then. Mm -hmm. And he decided to accept it. He took his oldest daughter, Martha, to France with him. But while he was over there, his youngest daughter, Lucy, died of an illness. And the other daughter, Polly, was so distraught that Thomas Jefferson sent for her. Now, uh, an older slave was supposed to accompany uh, the two, I mean, the, the daughter, but instead, Sally Hemings, for whatever reason, was sent, and she arrived in France. There, she was trained, along with Polly and the oldest daughter, Martha, in uh, French, and the ways of a handmaiden, a lady handmaiden. Many yards of fabric were or ordered for Sally and the girls, and she was dressed like them. And in France, she was free. Slavery was outlawed in France. So she was a servant there, and she even received wages for yes, her did. services. At any rate, at some time during the period, they were there about three years, uh, Thomas Jefferson took her as his concubine. Keep in mind, Sally was 14 when she went to France, and she was uh, about right. 16 by the time she was coming back. So you're talking about a girl age 14 to 16. And he was 30? 44. 44. That's 46. right. He was 44 when she got over there. Right. Which was not really unusual for that time because many men, not only men with their slaves, but men, period, would take wives who were young. Because once a young girl came into puberty and she could, she could have children, at that point in time, at, at any point, she could become the wife of someone. That was really not as unusual during that time, those of you who know the history part. That's right, and, and in childbirth, they'd be healthier. A lot of women died off. As you saw, John Wales had three wives that died of childbirth. So, as least we think they did. At any rate, uh, when it came time to go back, her brother James, by the way, was there training as a French chef to go back with Jefferson to cook at Monticello. And uh, he wanted her to come back, and neither one of them wanted to go, because why would you want to go back to slavery? But anyway, he made her lavish promises, offering her freedom for her children, any children that they had by the age of 21, and special privileges for all, and a good life in Virginia. Somehow or other, he persuaded her, and I don't think it's too hard to imagine that he was a very persuasive man. She was a young 16-year-old. Uh, her mother was back there, all her family was back there. She'd stayed in France, there was a black community in France, but she'd only have her brother, and here she was pregnant with her first child, Thomas. So she did go back with him. And then? Okay, so she comes back to America, pregnant with Thomas Jefferson's first child. The child is born and the child is named Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Hemings, Thomas Jefferson Hemings. There we go. I think I got the name right. <laughs> At any rate, this child got up to probably about 11, 12 years old, and by the time he was at an age that there was a lot of controversy going around. The, you know, the world was a lot smaller then. We don't have, you know, people knew about things going on at the farm across the road and down a few miles down the road. And they knew about Jefferson's 
strange looking child that looked just like him. You realize now that you've got a, third, a second, third generation now of white mixed with white. So this child looked very white and looked very much like Thomas Jefferson. And there was a man that you, the young lady talked about named Callender who began to make accusations about Jefferson and his child. And they called him, uh, they knew his name was Thomas. And they called Sally, Dusty Sally. And there were a lot of things that happened. And what to, to try to offset that, Jefferson took this young man and they sent him away from Monticello, the home of, uh, that they lived at, and he went to supposedly some people that were cousins. And the Woodson family is still trying to do all the history of what happened to young Tom after that, but we know that he did stay with someone named Woodson that was a relative of Jefferson. We don't even know that he lived anymore as a slave because there's really no account of it, but eventually Thomas Woodson shows up again many years later in Ohio with some of our other relatives. In the meantime, Sally continues to live in Monticello, and she has other children by Thomas Jefferson. She had six children. Of those children, uh, one child died at childbirth, another child lived to be an infant and died, and then she had a child named Harriet. We wanted you to pay attention to these names that are coming now. One daughter named Harriet, that she had, and she had a son named Beverly. Harriet and Beverly, by the age of 21, are shown in Jefferson's farm book as being runaways. And that's how, and they were runaway at about the age that they were 21. Coincidence, right? Uh, not only did, are they uh, listed as runaway, if you read some of the other memoirs of the overseer, he talks about the fact that he took young Harriet uh, in a uh, carriage to Washington City which is now Washington, D.C., and how much money did she? $50. She was given $50, which was, a lot. which was a lot of money back at the time that she went off. So this young girl who ran away was taken in a carriage to Washington City with $50 to start a new life, and she passed into uh, the white community. Uh, just to give you a footnote here, we have, we have someone who's in touch with us now that's in California that claims to possibly be a descendant through the Harriet Hemings family and thinks they have information that leads to that link. In the meantime, Beverly, her brother, also went to the same city and he passed into the white community. Then that left the other two sons that were Madison Hemings and Esther Hemings, the youngest. These two young men lived in Monticello with their mother until the death of their father, Thomas Jefferson. In his will, he gave freedom to these two young men as well as three other slaves. Only five slaves were ever freed by Thomas Jefferson. And all of these slaves were either Hemings or associated with the Hemings. All the, yes, they were the cousins, but not, no, nobody else, everyone else was sold to take care of his finances, or they died on the, on the plantation. Now, in his will it stated that Madison Hemings and Esther Hemings were to be free. He also petitioned the legislature, not only does he want them to be free, but allow them to stay in the state of Virginia past one year. If you're in Virginia more than a year and you're a free slave, you can be re-enslaved. Thomas Jefferson knew that. He also knew that they that he wanted them to be to have freedom to stay there, so he petitioned for them to stay in that state beyond a year as free persons. We know that that actually happened because initially the first census that was taken shows uh, Esther Hemings as head of household with another man with we, that we know was Madison Hemings and a woman. They're all listed as Caucasian in their family. But then there's a special census that's taking of about a year or so later that shows them living as mulatto. So we know that that was taken in consideration and they continued to live there. At any rate, those two young men stayed in the state of Virginia until their mother either died or left, and we're again, we have yeah, other, so much is happening now with our family yeah. that we're getting more and more information. According to most, Sally Hemings died in Virginia, but now we have information that maybe she really didn't die in Virginia, she may have died later. Until we can justify that, we don't know. We just know that they stayed at such time till her, their mother left, whichever way she departed. They moved into the state of Ohio. Madison Hemings and Esther Hemings both had wives by then. Madison Hemings' wife and Esther Hemings' wife were also mulattoes and freed women, and they moved into the southern part of Ohio 
Chillicothe area and another area called P.P. Hill. It's uh, also an interesting footnote that Jefferson did own property in Ohio. Yes. And that's where his three sons that we know of settled. <coughs> so all, when Madison and Eston arrived in southern Ohio, guess who else was living in southern Ohio but Thomas Woodson, the brother that had first left from years before. Madison Hemings is the one that I come through. Madison Hemings had nine children. Of those nine children, one of the children he had was named Harriet. Harriet had a daughter named Fanny. Fanny was Sarah Francis, and Sarah Francis had a daughter named Ursel Francis. Hear these names again. Ursel Francis had a daughter named Francis Bernice. Francis Bernice had a daughter named Sharon Francine. Who calls herself Shay, who's sitting in front of you today? <laughs> the younger brother had a son named Beverly. And Beverly had a son named Carl, who had a son named William, who had a daughter named Julia, who was named after Beverly's wife. So the names do repeat themselves. <coughs> I'll tell you a little bit about what those boys did. Let me yeah. stop one second here, though. I bet you these people wonder, how the heck do they know they're related? Well, there you are. You That's wonder how, question. you ever wonder why, how we know that? Nobody wonders. They already know. Julie, this is a good group. <laughs> this early is right up on this. <laughs> Anyone brave enough to say you wonder how I know that? Okay. There's one person right down there. Okay. If we, since in, in space of time, since we've said those names, maybe we can show these pictures. Yes, that's a good idea. With, along with doing this, so we can get you through this part. Now, I'm going to ask you a question because I got you involved before. I met a gentleman earlier who was telling me about his grandmother, who's in her 90s. Does anyone here have a grandmother? Raise your hand. Does anyone here have a great-grandmother alive? <gasps> All righty. Now, some people might even have a great-great. I don't know. Hands are down. But at least we got great-greats. Okay. Now, but we're getting ready to show you. Put that first picture up for us. I'm showing you how I know. My mother lived in a household with her mother and her grandmother. Those of you who have a grandmother... And my mother's great-grandmother used to come and visit her, okay? Now, those of you who have a great-grandmother. Now, can you imagine those of you who have a grandmother and a great-grandmother telling your grandmother you could not possibly remember who your grandparents are? Could you tell your grandmother that without her knocking you into the next century? <laughs> you couldn't do that, right? My mother used to describe her great-grandmother. She said, Grandma Spears looked like a shriveled, looked like a little shriveled up white lady. <laughs> and since I never had a picture of Grandma Spears, I didn't know what she was talking about. Well, Harriet Hemings Butler Spears was my mother's great grandmother who visited my mother's home. So you have these three, four generations of family together. Harriet Hemings Butler Spears was Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings' granddaughter. She was the daughter of Madison Hemings. Now, do I need to tell you why and how I know who I am? If Grandma Spears was alive and well and my mother knew her, our oral history is a fact. It is a fact. I don't need even DNA to tell me who I am because Bernice proves that. So who, what you have in front of you now is Thomas Jefferson's granddaughter, Sally Hemings' granddaughter. And next to her is the grandson, her cousin, Beverly Jefferson. The way that happened was, not Beverly Hemings, is that Eston, when he had three teenage children in Ohio, he was very near Madison, he was a fiddle player and had a band and went all over the, the neighborhood with all the people and so forth. But he decided and made the heart-wrenching decision with his wife, Julia, that they would move on and pass into the white community to give their children more opportunities, I imagine. But at any rate, they moved off to Wisconsin, never to return to Ohio. It must have been really a wrench for them, leaving everything they knew and going into this strange world. Uh, so much so that Eston died four years after that at the age of 48, and I, don't, I suspect that that may have had something to do with it. At any rate, he had this son named Beverly, and, and Julia, for whom I'm named, and there's his picture. Now, 
The thing is, I didn't know because the only thing in his obituary in, the, in the Madison, Wisconsin, it said, this man was the grandson of Thomas Jefferson. Well, I thought it was a misprint because my family covered up the fact that we had any African-American roots whatsoever. We were supposed to be related to Jefferson's uncle Peter, and his father's name was Peter, so they didn't even get that right. But at any rate, they covered up the story completely, and we did pass into the white community. And plus the fact your name being Jefferson, he didn't have any sons who lived, so there's no, no way the name Jefferson could have passed no. on no. through that. That's so right. only through the, the daughters. That's right. Now, Madison Hemings, on the other hand, lived in a mulatto community, and he stayed a man of color. What you're seeing are two people who were first cousins. She lived as a woman of color. He lived as a Caucasian. Do they look a lot different to you? Not really, do they? Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna go down the next generation and show you a little bit of activity starts taking place in my family here. <laughs> See there, I told you didn't. <laughs> okay, there's Sarah Francis, or we call her Fanny. Fanny Chapman, uh, Harriet had three children. Fanny married a man named Mr. Chapman, and they moved into the city of Columbus, Ohio. And Fanny was a very strong, uh, devout Christian woman no nonsense and she lived in my mother's home with her till my mother my mother well grandma fanny used to hold me in her lap when i was a little baby because she she got to see her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren and uh she used to walk to the church with paper bags over her feet in cold weather to keep herself together because she was not going to ever miss the service for the lord she would have loved to have heard you young people here singing today because she would have been praising the Lord with you. That's Fanny and you can see we got a little bit of color taking place now. So this would be the great granddaughter. And then that's my grandfather Carl and as you can see he did indeed take advantage of the Caucasian community. Now, his father Beverly uh, owned two hotels in Madison and an omnibus company and he also invented a, a heater for his passengers feet so he carried on the Jefferson invention kind of thing. Anyway, they had the, all the privileges of the white community, as you can see. <coughs> then one more. We'll show you one more picture and get these, this, this stuff off of here. Finals, the final ones. Guess who that lady is behind me? Mom. My mama. <laughs> That's my daddy, William. <laughs> <laughs> kind of resemble, don't we? Just a little bit. That's Frances Bernice, who named her daughter Sharon Francine. Let me tell you these names. My mother had a sister. I didn't tell them about children. Oh, you know you did. My mother's, my aunt, my mother had one sister who lived to adulthood. My aunt's full name was Virginia Wells. Her middle name was Wells. I didn't know that until she died. And I remember asking my cousin, I said, where did she get that strange middle name from? And my cousin said, mother hated her name because she said she was named after a state and a country. She thought she was named after the state of Virginia and the country of Wales. But there's a discrepancy about the middle, the middle name because remember John Wales. So we don't know if it's W-H-A-Y-L-E-S or W-A-L-E-S. We've never known the correct spelling for G's middle name because she would never use it. Virginia and the name Francis. You think about Francis, where does that come from? France. Sally lived in France. I mean, yeah, these, and amazing. then... Cuff and Julia's got the same names through there. Yep. Yeah, Beverly's a very unusual name for a, for a man, so. And, uh, I guess I can imagine if we had family like this, you can get rid of that stuff right there if you want to now. We must have had an impact on us. Mm -hmm. My life has been probably dictated by the family I came up in. Julia, you had a lot of privileges, it sounds like. I mean, oh, yes. your family had money. Oh, my God. <laughs> Inventions and stuff like that. Yeah, my grandparents. Your grandparents. We lived. Uh, we, I was born in the Great Depression, so my parents. Uh, my father couldn't find a job, so we moved in with my grandparents, and they had living mates and three Packard cars in the garage. But nobody had cars. Belonged to country club. My fa my grandfather was a pillar of the Episcopal Church. All the things that go with privilege, which I completely took for granted. I mean, as a child, you grow up in that atmosphere, and you think that's the way the world is. We had a neighborhood. Uh, you didn't know your neighbors very well. Uh, just to say hello. To